Today we're going to be talking about moving out of our studios into the plein air to work to practice catching the light. Our studios are super comfortable places. There are zones where we're really used to being creative and leaving that space, that comfort, for the great outdoors to paint can truly be intimidating the first couple of times you do that. So I want to talk about several things that you can do to make yourself so much more successful when you go outside. So here's what I want you to do in planning your first or maybe your next plein air painting adventure. Number one, start close to home. So try painting in your own back deck or yard and you won't have to deal with onlookers and their comments except for family and you can hush them up. Also the challenge of finding something interesting to paint in the familiar is a really great exercise. If you're heading out to paint somewhere else for the first time, I would suggest picking something that's still familiar, maybe as familiar or almost as familiar as home. So when I really started painting outside seriously, I picked an area that I was really familiar with from traveling through it every day. Makes a big difference in that comfort level and releasing any anticipation anxiety that you have so that you can get more in the flow. Number two is use the best paint that you can afford. You've heard me say this before if you've had any courses with me. You really do get what you pay for with the paint. And I love the rich hues and buttery handling of Williamsburg, which is my personal favorite. I also really love Gamblin. But I use an assortment of other really high quality brands as well. The better paints have less filler, so you actually save money in the end. If you need to make your paint stretch out, it's easy to add an extender that will give you a student grade paint at a fraction of the cost. Third, I want you to get really comfortable with your painting equipment. You know, go back to number one and see that. Try doing that at home first. So it takes time to get comfortable with brushes, knives, new easels, new painting surfaces. And the only way to get comfortable with it is just to use it. So let go of the idea that each painting has to be perfect and dive in so that your comfort level with that piece of equipment or that material will really increase. You've heard me say it before, keep your equipment light. And did I say keep it light? I really did. So the very first time you have to haul too much stuff across the open terrain, you'll start eliminating all of those unnecessary things. The lighter and more compact your equipment is, the more likely you are to actually pack it up and go out. Keep it simple. If you have a very simple pack, you can keep it in your car or your truck so that it's always there and always ready to use when the right moment strikes to get out and paint. Next, place your easel out of direct light. If at all possible, I don't use an umbrella, I make sure that my easel is set up in the shade. Umbrellas have a way of tipping over in the breeze and the wind, even the most well-designed plein air umbrella. And again, that's another thing to haul. So set up your easel out of direct light in a piece of shade so that you can judge your colors more accurately and you're not staring at a sunlit panel. You'll get much less funky reflections off of your brushes, your painting knives, and your panel. Another thing that really helps set you up for success is to paint in the early morning or the late afternoon. That time of day, those two times of day, will give you the strongest angle of light and give you the most contrast. So you'll get really interesting dynamic value relationships. It's slightly easier in the afternoon because the angles get stronger, so you're painting towards the more contrasty light rather than reverse, but either one will work. Next, really think about preparing for visual overload. Simplify, simplify, simplify. I like using a slide mount or a viewfinder to look through as I'm analyzing what the subject needs to be for my composition. So a simple old-fashioned slide mount will work, although there are viewfinders that are out there for sale as well. What that does is it blocks out the surrounding details so that you can focus just on what is in front of you. 
So now I'm going to take you outside with me to look over my shoulder as I work on a painting plein air. Just wanted to give y'all a little bit of a inside view on how I paint and why I paint, where I paint. So Congaree is an area, it's not a town, outside of Columbia. And it's about halfway between the bustling metropolises of Hopkins and Eastover, near the crossroads of Minervaville, where I have painted a whole lot. One of the reasons I really love this area is, as you can see behind me, it's an area of wide open fields and big skies. So you can see we've got a little bit of sun and a lot of clouds today, but this area is really flat for the most part. We're below the fall line in South Carolina, so it is super flat, wide open fields, woods too, but you get a lot of big skies, big open fields, and glorious skies. So those big fields and skies for me, since I'm obsessed with chasing that light and color, become like a huge canvas, nature's canvas. So there is so much to paint around here, I never get tired of it. So this is where I set up my easel to make the painting. After I selected my composition from using the viewfinder that you saw earlier, I next worked in my sketchbook. Just like in the studio, Making a thumbnail is a critical part of the plein air painting process. Do not skip this step. You'll learn to see the basic values and shapes when you make a thumbnail sketch. So simplifying the values to three to five and the number of shapes to five to seven is really crucial for being able to capture the light. The light will change dramatically, as you can see in these photos, from moment to moment, quite literally. So you need to have that thumbnail as your roadmap, as you're moving forward with your painting. The values will change, the colors not so much. You also want to look for bold patterns of light and dark. Study the pattern of light and dark shapes called Notan and their sense of unity, the Gestalt. When compositions work in limited values in black and white, they'll be even stronger in color. It's also really important to look for warm and cool color contrasts. They actually speak just as loudly as contrast in value. So look at the contrast between the cool colors here in the shadows and the warmer colors here in the highlights. Next, pick one key dominant color. Start with this key color and choose all the other colors in relationship to it. This way you achieve strong unity and harmony. Mix your basic palette before you get started. Here's some of the basic colors I started out with. It's a green that has a little bit of blue mixed in with it. So that's that value, the color for the overall shape. Then to make a shadow color for that, I added blue to it. You can see that right here. So it becomes a blue green. So it's equally intense, but darker. And you can see that a little bit more clearly when I'm back up here a little. Then to make the next value up, I added yellow to the green to get a yellow green. Equally intense, but inherently lighter so that it lightens it, but not dulling it enormously. The greens I use have a little bit of dullness to them to make them look more natural, but it's not a dulled out green. I haven't just added white to the green that you see right here. That's basically Italian terra verde. Then to get another value up from this one, I added more of the yellow, Indian yellow and yellow ochre, and end up with a color that's more yellow than yellow green very similar to cinnabar green light. So then for the next color up where the light is hitting it, I'm going warmer and up on the value on the color wheel, not the value wheel. So this one has that same yellow green in it, but has a little bit of orange in there as well. 
so that there is a distinct difference between the yellow green here, which is about a value 4 actually. It's not nearly as light as we think it is. Our brains tend to override reality to about a value 3 to 2.5 with the orange mixed in with it, sort of a coral color that's mixed in with it. Again, I had three different values of a violet mixed with green down here at the bottom as well. And they stayed intense because of my going to colors that were down but equally intense to darken and up but equally intense to lighten. To get started, it can help to outline those basic five to seven shapes with a neutral color on your panel. Then block in the no tan shape with that dominant shadow color that you've already selected. You also want to work from dark to light, background to foreground. It's very hard when painting a la prima to put dark on top of light. The paints tend to mix and muddy. Also when painting plein air, the shadows will change really quickly. So it's important to establish those early and keep them clean. Here we're right at about 430, which is the light I was shooting for. And you can see here, I've got the painting blocked in. So let's pan up here where you can see what the landscape looks like right now. And you can see how I was painting towards this lighting situation. It's not at all like it was earlier. But knowing what happens to those shapes as the light moves across the pasture makes a big difference in being able to move towards the light as you paint. So this is the stage that it's at right now. I'm going to keep tweaking it a little bit and then stop before I think it's done so that I don't overdo it. So here it's 5 o'clock and we're going to take a look at the final painting. It ended up being a gorgeous, beautiful afternoon with actually way more sunlight than I expected. So, um, we've had a really nice afternoon with strong, strong light. And um, here's the final painting. I may tweak it a little bit when I get back into the studio. But one of the things I know is that you need to stop before you think you're finished. So, I'm done for the day. I'll look at it again in the studio maybe tomorrow or Monday but I'm not going to do anything more to it right now. And you can see right now how dramatically different the light is in the late afternoon than it was in the early morning. So it's ended up being a spectacular day. So I hope you've enjoyed our little painting adventure today. Now it's your turn to head outside to catch the light. Happy painting, everyone.